My dearly beloved in Christ, family cares and difficulties also offer great opportunity for submission to the will of God, along with reverses of fortune and difficulty in making a living. The revolt of Absalom's own son was directed against David for a political purpose. But this did not prevent David from attributing him rightly to the permissive will of God. The devil brought about the misfortunes of Job because he was a just and God-fearing man. But this was only because God gave the devil permission to afflict Job in such a way. In times of persecution, millions of Catholics were deprived of rank and position, despoiled of their possessions, torn from their families, thrown into prison, tortured, and sent to execution all for their faith and religious convictions. Far from complaining, strengthened by supernatural grace, they went their way like the apostles, rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. My dearly beloved in Christ, we must also conform our will to God's when beset with adversity, calumny, and disgrace. Cashin tells the story of an old man was attacked by a mob of pagans in Alexandria. He remained calm and unruffled in spite of insults and blows. Someone asked him mockingly, what miracles had Christ worked? He had just worked one, the old man replied. For in spite of all you've done to me, I haven't been angry with you or at the least bit upset. My dearly beloved in Christ, this does not, however, negate the fact that we have a right to self-defense. God does, not, God does expect us to do what we can to fix the situation according to his will. But it's when we cannot do anything about a certain things that we should offer them up to God. Putting up with our defects of nature, both physical and mental, should be included in conformity to the will of God. We should consider what we have as sufficient because God, with our best interests at heart, has willed it so. God gives us what's in accord with the designs he has for us. The important thing is to use well what he's given us. Perhaps one of the most difficult areas in which to make our wills submissive is with regard to sickness and infirmity. We can pray for such a cross to be taken away or for the grace to persevere through it. But ultimately, we must accept the time it comes, the time it lasts, and all the circumstances attending it as the will of God. St. Alphonsus says, For my part, I call illness the touchstone of the spirit, for it is then that true virtue of a man is discovered. We must refrain from impatience and rebellion at such a time by praying to God for strength and courage. Conformity to the will of God should be carried even to the point of accepting our death. All must die. The day, the hour, and the manner has already been decided by God. The teaching of the great masters of the spiritual life hold that a person who at the point of death makes an act of perfect Conformity to the will of God can be delivered not only from hell, but also from purgatory. The reason, says St. Alphonsus, is that he who accepts death with perfect resignation acquires similar merit to that of a martyr who has voluntarily given his life up for Christ. And even amidst the greatest sufferings, he will die happily and joyfully. Finally, spiritually, we can also practice the mission of the will of God when beset by spiritual dryness, the loss of spiritual consolation, and when we suffer the consequences of our sins. Interior trials such as temptations, scruples, anxieties, aridity, desolation, etc. are permitted by God for our sanctification. It's true to say that these may sometimes have their origin in the ignorance of our mind, the oversensitiveness of our feelings, the disordered state of our imagination or the perversity of our inclinations. But if we go back farther, if we ask where 
the defects themselves come from, we can only find their origin in the permissive will of God who has not endowed us with greater perfection. Since as a result of original sin, God has made us subject to these infirmities, we must for our sanctification bear all their consequences until he's pleased to put an end to them. Even if some are directly from the devil, Satan has no power over us unless it's permitted by God. Everything is meant for our good, and such trials ought to be counted as special graces from God. In closing, I still have a story, but anyway. In closing, let us ponder the words of C.S. Lewis. We're not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We're wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. So we're not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We're wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. That's why trust in God is essential in accepting all things as coming from. And we must realize that what is really important in our life is what God wants to do through and for us. God only desires from us our love, shown by obedience and submission to his holy will. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of paradox where through the ugly defeat of a cross, a holy God is utterly glorified. Victory comes through defeat, healing through brokenness, finding self through losing self. Our success, mad, egocentric culture cannot grasp that crucial truth. It's understandable only when the false values that obsess us are stripped away. God's ways are not our ways. Without the grace of God, we cannot understand that everything he does or permits in our life is directed by his infinite love and mercy. If we consistently conform our wills to God's holy will, we will experience supernatural calm, joy, and peace. We also glorify God and merit a high degree of glory in heaven. My dearly beloved in Christ, the story of Martin, the monk related by St. Gregory the Great, gives an edifying example of conformity to the will of God. This great servant of God had retired to the solitude of a mountain cave where God, as a singular proof of his love for him, had miraculously caused a spring of water to flow for the quenching of his thirst. But the devil provoked at the holy life Martin led in this cavern apart from all conversation with men, began to molest him with frightful apparitions. As a saintly monk was at his prayers, the fiend would appear to him under the likeness of venomous and hideous serpents, which sometimes sprang toward him as if about to devour him, and sometimes coiled around his feet or his body in order to disturb him in his holy exercise. If the monk lay down, to take the repose he needed, the serpent stretched itself at his side in order to trouble his sleep. Such was, however, the conformity of Martin to the holy will of God, strengthened as it was by his conviction that this infernal serpent could do him no hurt, that he stretched out that monster that this infernal serpent could do him no hurt, that He stretched out to the monster his hand or his foot, saying, Bite me if you dare. I shall not hinder you. This diabolical obsession lasted three whole years. At length, worsted by such constancy, the hellish monster broke out one day into a dismal yell, and belching forth fire and flame, he cast himself headlong from the mountaintop, dragging in his fall the boulders and trees that run the steep of the mountain. The holy doctor concludes by observing to what sublime heights this man of God had reached since for three whole years he had remained quiet and undaunted in the company of a monster from hell. Such is the power of conformity to the will of God when strengthened and supported by lively trust that God will protect us and bring our trials to a happy termination. The story shows us how to carry our crosses bravely. It also encourages us to trust that God orders and permits everything for our welfare. 
Our confidence in God will give us greater self-control in dealing with 